many hours did you spend on the internet today? One, maybe two? On average, Australians spend almost six hours a day on their devices. And every time we connect, we're fair game for a hacker. Sometimes the consequences can be devastating. Take the case of a small Australian IT company. It built itself up over 10 years. It was destroyed in just three weeks by a random cyber attack. The work of an unemployed truck driver who learned his trade in chat sites and on YouTube. He was arrested planning to attack 300 other businesses. So imagine if the perpetrator was far better resourced and more sophisticated, and if the target was critical infrastructure, an attack capable of bringing down an entire city. Tonight, in a joint project with the Wheeler Centre AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne, our expert panel will discuss that very real possibility in a hypothetical cyber security crisis. Russia's infiltration of the US election campaign sent shockwaves through the US and now its reverberations are being felt by Australia's political establishment. This is the new frontier of warfare, it's the new frontier of espionage. The cyber attack that started Tuesday is wreaking havoc across the globe Wednesday crippling thousands of computers, disrupting operations at ports from Mumbai to Los Angeles, and halting production at a chocolate factory in Australia. Every second of every day, hackers are hard at work across the globe. In Australia alone, there were 47,000 cyber incidents in 2017. That's 128 a day, five every hour. Many of them will be online scams or frauds. If you think something is a scam, it probably is, so don't respond. Do the rest the are even more serious. Please leave your message after the beep. Hey, this is Rajiv in finance. Call me as soon as you get this. Stop. It could be hackers holding a company to ransom, locking access to files until money is paid. Call and get this. Joining conference now. Apparently there is a malware attack targeting our main... It's ransomware. They're holding us hostage. Or stealing staff log-on details to access corporate or government systems or a denial-of-service attack designed to effectively shut down a network by overwhelming it with requests. The census website was subject to something called denial-of-service, outsiders blocking traffic. It repelled three attacks, but it couldn't stop a fourth, which coincided with both the peak period of Australians trying to log on and the hardware blocking overseas traffic failing. In just one month earlier this year, there were 7,200 denial-of-service attacks on Australian targets. The intelligence agencies had a high degree of confidence the attack came from China. Officially, it's foreign states which have the greatest power to compromise Australian networks. I can confirm reports that the Bureau of Meteorology suffered a significant cyber intrusion, which was first discovered early last year. Cybercrime costs the economy more than a billion dollars a year. And the government says malicious activity is becoming more frequent, more sophisticated and more severe. One in four small businesses have been hit, but big business often has the most to lose, along with major institutions. And many are vulnerable, running obsolete technology which can't be updated or patched to address a weakness. Last November, 41% of critical systems at Victoria Police and four key state government departments were labelled obsolete by the state's Auditor General. And Victoria is not the only state using outdated technology. So what happens if operators lose control of a power grid or hospital staff can't access patient records? Hackers can launch a large-scale strategic attack within minutes. It's happened overseas and it could happen here. So to our panel for tonight's hypothetical, we have at the end here Dr. Tobias Feekin. Tobias is Australia's inaugural ambassador for cyber 
Affairs. Next to Tobias, we have Alistair McGibbon. Alistair is head of the Australian Cyber Security Centre. He's also the National Cyber Security Advisor. He is the man the government turns to when there's a cyber security crisis. Uh, Dr. Marlene Kanga is president of the World Federation of Engineering Organisation. She's also a board member of Sydney Water. And tonight, Marlene is playing the CEO of Get Lights On Power, which happens to have the acronym GLOW. Uh, GLOW is responsible for supplying power for all of Melbourne, the CBD, and also a number of inner suburbs. And next to Marlene, we have Craig Latsley. Craig is uh, in uniform because he is indeed the Emergency Management Commissioner for Victoria, which means he's responsible for coordination and control over all emergencies in this state. And Megan Haas is the Cyber and Forensic Services Partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And tonight, Megan is playing key advisor to Glow Power. So the client is fake, but the role is not. And here at the end, we have Dottie Schindlinger. Uh, Dottie is Vice President and the Governance Tech uh, Technology Evangelist for Diligent Corporation, which is a key provider of secure board communication software. And tonight, Dottie's been brought in from the United States to provide specialist advice to the new CEO of a major public hospital here in Melbourne, the State Institute for Care, which has the rather unfortunate acronym <laughs> of SIC. Uh, as it happens, SIC has got 570 beds, which is exactly the same number of beds that the Royal Melbourne Hospital has. Please welcome <laughs> our panel. <laughs> Well, it's 3.30 in the afternoon on a cold winter's day and the city of Melbourne is heading towards the rush hour. For staff over at Glow Power, it's business as usual. But by 3.31pm, the call centre at Glow Power has gone into meltdown. They've been overwhelmed by a sudden flood of automated calls. The IT support team is very... Quickly on the case, it's all hands on deck as they try and work out what's happening. At 3.35 p.m. in the Glow Power control room, one of the operators suddenly sees the cursor of his computer glide across the screen entirely of its own accord. He watches as it heads to the substation circuit breaker controls, clicks on the box to open the circuit breaker, and takes the substation offline. Instantaneously, thousands of people are without power. The operator tries to take back control, but he can't. He's effectively logged out of his own system. He knows that pulling the plug out of the wall isn't going to help. There are a number of other systems infected. He and his colleagues are powerless as they watch circuit breaker after circuit breaker be opened and substation after substation be taken offline. Within minutes, we have a million people in Melbourne without power. The CBD, Port Melbourne to Borwin, Northcote to Caulfield. At 3.42, this operator tries desperately, not surprisingly, to get hold of IT support. Of course, that's no mean feat. IT support is now all caught up with trying to handle the massive number of automated calls to the call centre. Eventually, they get through to the head of IT on his mobile. Over at head office, Marlene Kanga, as CEO of Glow Power, you were in the middle of writing an email when the power went out. Pretty quickly, your backup generator in the building kicked in, but you know that's only a temporary fix. And by 4.05 p.m., your IT security officer is on the phone. He essentially tells you that, effectively, they've lost control of the network, 40 substations are offline, a million people out of power. What's your response? Uh, well, it's clearly we've, we've got a cyber attack. We have uh, been analysing the possibility and preparing for such a, a, a contingency for a while. We recognise the signs and we are going into crisis mode immediately. Uh, we, the first thing we've got to do is to secure our substations and uh, ensure that there's no physical damage. So we're going to, we've sent out our technicians to all the substations. We've called in everyone, uh, uh, you know, including those who weren't on shift, 
to go out to these substations. All our technical experts are on the road. Because you actually don't know whether they've been blown up. No, we don't. So we, we don't know the extent of the damage. We don't know the extent of the attack. So we are in investigative mode, but we're also trying to do damage control. Uh, so we, we are going to also start communicating with our stakeholders. So we want to tell our customers uh, that we have an attack. There's a denial of service attack on our customer service center. And uh, we will use text messages and all other forms of communication uh, to let them know that something is up bef and before we figure out how we're going to deal with it. You, of course, have, because as you said yourself, you're very aware of this uh, you know, possibility. You have a specialist cyber advisor, Megan Haas. Do you give her a call? Yes, absolutely. We've been working with Megan uh, for a while and uh, we have developed uh, plans, contingency plans. Uh, we've done risk assessments on our, on, on our networks. And we've also practiced uh, emergency response. But this, uh, this uh, scale of attack, I, I would have to say, is unprecedented in that it's a dual attack, both on our customer service center as well as on our substations. So we're definitely uh, calling Megan, and uh, we'd like her to give us advice as we go along. Well, there's one problem here, of course. Megan has been caught up in this attack because all the landlines are no longer working and incredibly quickly the mobile network becomes congested. Uh, Megan, as much as she would have liked to, doesn't actually get your call and can't pick up. But of course, over at Emergency uh, Services, Emergency Management, Victoria Craig Lapsley, what is unfolding in Melbourne is becoming very apparent to you on your screens. You've got all peak hour trains and trams. They've all ground to a halt. You've got at least three trains stuck in the city loop, you've got all your lights out, your traffic lights out. Your direct reports have been in contact with Glow Power. What do you do? Well, straight away, we've got a, a case of chaos. Um, you think about it. It's, uh, it's bringing everything to a halt. It's taking normality to a place where people are saying, what do I need to do? So they'll need help. And uh, obviously, the telecommunication system is still working, so triple zero would be um, overloaded by people seeking support. And obviously, first responders of VicPol, um, fire, and also ambulance would be um, triaging exactly where they need to. And if we've got trains stuck between stations, we've got trains stuck in tunnels, um, they've got to become the priority. Obviously, a tram in the street can actually unload its, its passengers and they can walk away, but those that can't need to be dealt with. So, so we would be working through that. The interesting thing we would not know in the initial minutes, and I would say it's quite a few minutes, is the cause of this. So we would be saying the impact is a loss of power and we would be looking back to find out through AEMO, who is a responsibility to oversee the energy, the, the electricity That's the network energy market operator. operator has a, has a responsibility to, to look at the network. Uh, we've got great connections to them, so that would be our first port of call to say... But you'd also pick up the phone, the phone, wouldn't you, to Glow Power and say to yes. Marlene, how much do we know now yeah. about what's going so on? So the next thing is about intelligence, isn't it? And there's two parts of intelligence. is what does the in, in industry itself know, but have a look at social media. Have a look at what's happening out there. The community would be telling there is an issue. And we would see the extent of this very quickly through triple zero, social media monitoring, the story will be told and we will have to gather that story to understand the extent of the problem, but we've got a problem. Uh, we would escalate that in the emergency management arrangements to say, first thing is what do we know and what do we need to tell people and we need to get that coordinated. So the coordination of communications out and in, so two-way communications will be absolutely critical. And then we'd focus what are the impacts and a little bit later, what are the consequences of those impacts? Well, indeed, on communications by this point uh, at Glow Power, Marlene, you've managed to open your door to find Megan Haas is there. She's a little out of breath. She's basically hot-footed it across the city. It's the fastest way of getting to you. And one of the, the biggest questions that you both have is, of course, communication. Marlene and, and Megan, are you happy to allow Craig to take the running on communications? At this point, you have a, a, a major corporate reputation to protect. Yes, I think uh, we need to work with emergency services, but we also need to get a message out uh, from the company as to what's happening, what we think the cause is, and what we're doing about it. And also to communicate to critical stakeholders, including the Premier of the state, uh, and also 
perhaps our uh, customers who are particularly vulnerable, those on dialysis, for example, who need power, uh, so individuals and, of course, the hospitals. What, what is your advice regarding mm. where Marlene should go mm. next? So I think um, Marlene is, is undertaking all of the, the, the right actions immediately within the frame of her organisation. One of the questions that I would be raising with Marlene is um, others that may be similarly impacted um, in the sector and recommending that we reach out to the um, Australian Cyber Security Centre and the, the local um, joint cyber security centre based here in Melbourne um, that contains the, um, the emergency response team from a computer um, emergency perspective and bringing them in as soon as possible such that we can start um, broadening the avenues to try and uncover um, what's occurred. Try and work out what's actually gone wrong. Well, I was going to say, of course, we do have a, a national cyber security centre and, in fact, it is the focal point for cyber security efforts by, and this is no uh, short list, the Australian Signals Directorate, the Computer Emergency Response Team, the Defence Intelligence Organisation, the Criminal Intelligence Commission, the Federal Police and ASIO, pretty much everyone and anyone who would have anything to do with a cyber crisis. Who's given Alistair McGiven a call? Someone's given him a call at this point? Yeah, so have you got his number? We've all called. <laughs> we, we would have all called. Uh, more, as important in a system sense, though, and this is, when I talk about an emergency, it's actually chaos. We're managing chaos. So, so in Victoria, we've got a cyber centre. It's new. Uh, it's been developed for that exact reason, and that's where we would engage there, and they would have the responsibility to talk up to Alistair yep. in, a, in a national sense, and it's well structured. So, Alistair, you get the call. You've been brief now on what's happened. What are your lines of authority? Because what I didn't say earlier was that you're actually in Home Affairs, and Home Affairs is a very vast new department still being bedded town. How, how clear is it for you where you fit in this structure? Well, Ali, firstly, we'd probably also know because we have staff sitting inside the Crisis Coordination Centre in Canberra who monitor media, who have uh, connections with all of the state uh, crisis centres. So uh, I probably knew before I was getting a call from Megan, and, and uh, Craig's right, there would be a lot of calls coming. Um, I sit both within Home Affairs in the National Cyber Security Advisor role, and I know where I sit there and what my role is, but I also have uh, the privilege of being inside the Signals Directorate running the Cyber Security Centre, so I, I know what my operational role is as well. Yes. So, so at this point, who's in charge? Is it uh, the company, Glow Power? Is it Craig in Melbourne? Is it you in Canberra? Uh, you've got so many different people who have got fingers in this pie. Sure. This is a Victorian government issue, really. That their, their job is to protect the people of Victoria. Craig uh, would be my first point, point of contact, uh, along with... Uh, my peers in the Victorian government in the in the cybersecurity arena, uh, their job is to deal with the consequences of the event. It doesn't really matter what the vector is. If it was a bushfire or a flood, and it knocked power out, Craig would be dealing with it. But at this point, it seems very clear, and certainly we've heard from Marlene that she's absolutely confident it's cyber attack. Do you call a crisis meeting in Canberra? This is the first major attack on critical infrastructure in this country. Absolutely. Uh, we would uh, kick in the Commonwealth crisis arrangements, uh, and, and there, there are well-established uh, committees in the Commonwealth for dealing with this. Uh, because, again, it's not like Australia doesn't suffer crises, they just don't often suffer cyber crises. So those same mechanisms that we rely upon for flood, cyclone, fire uh, are kicked off, uh, but with a, with a cyber focus. So I would sit with uh, that committee and my, my peer inside Home Affairs will chair that committee uh, and we would look to see what assistance we could render to the Victorian government. There's systems we use every day in emergency management, whether it's a fire or flood, cyber is a little different. And it won't be automatic that people will go, that's a cyber attack. Mm. It's a cyber issue. So it'll take a little while. What we will do in Victoria is talk to our cyber um, office, a joint, this joint cyber office. But if it is a cyber event, we would then make sure that Victoria Police is the lead agency to control it. Uh, so under our arrangements, I've got an oversight, but we still have to come to... If it's a fire, it'll be the fire agency. If it's a cyber attack, it'll be the police. And that would be very quick. There'd be three or four of us talk. What's the likelihood of this? Push up to Alistair. 
what is it that's telling us about this? Is there other intelligence mm -hmm. that's telling us something's not right? Mm. And if so, who do we appoint? And we do that super quickly. Well, let me just add a little bit more intelligence in there. Indeed, the energy market operator has been in contact with Craig and no other players have been hit at this point, but they have all gathered to try and assist Glow Power in any way that they can. Now, meanwhile, while all of that is going on, over at the sick public hospital, Dottie Schindlinger, you're in the middle of a board meeting. You're actually all feeling pretty pleased with yourselves because uh, your job is to ensure business continuity. And when the power went out, you switched to backup power with very smoothly, with very limited uh, disruption to patients in your hospital. But at 5 p.m., just as you're gearing up for a busy night, given the chaos on the streets outside, Every single computer screen in the hospital goes blank. Within seconds, the computer screens all display the same message. Where are your files? Followed by an announcement that the hospital's files have in fact been encrypted. And for the small cost of 15 Bitcoin, which is around $120,000, you can get the decryption keys. Dottie, what do you do? First of all, you've got a major problem here. You've got a 580-bed hospital and you've got no computers. Well, that's a great question. So first things first, we, we have to really focus on patient care. And the good thing is that um, this particular board meeting, we were in the midst of practicing for this very scenario. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ransomware being something that's happening quite regularly at healthcare institutions all around the globe. And so um, we, we do sort of have our response in place. Um, the first thing that we are making sure to do is is use our backup paper records to continue patient care. That is something that we've practiced. We drill for that every year. Um, so we are now back on paper systems, paper forms for issuing medications and paper forms for billing and the like. Do you um, shut down all the computer systems inside the hospital? We absolutely have. Now, of course, we know very well that that may do nothing um, because it could very well have infected the backup systems, and so we're going to have to investigate that. Um, but the most important thing right now is to focus on patient care and to make sure that we can continue to provide patient care. Um, what, what it seems to be the case right now, uh, at least in this early stage is that we've basically been locked out of our patient records, but so far it doesn't seem to have affected any of the life support systems. So the backup power generators are still keeping the patients alive and, and things are still moving forward. Um, we are diverting day surgery patients. We are diverting other non-critical cases to our peers. Um, so we're on the phones talking to our peers, trying to get coverage for some of the things that, that can be covered. Um, you know, the critical cases that are arriving into emergency department, we're still accepting those if we must. If we can divert them, we, we will. Um, so we're, we're just going right back into that same crisis mode response that we would really kind of in the event of any crisis that would knock out access to our systems. And then we have to figure out what to do about the ransom. And so we're going to first call our, our friends in law enforcement, talk to them about this, make sure to coordinate with them. Um, we're not going to just start buying Bitcoin and sending it through Tor on the dark web. We're going to take a minute and take a breath and really try to get our act together and make sure that we do this in a coordinated response. I'll leave you to ruminate on the question <laughs> of the ransom and whether or not you're going to pay it. I guess, though, once we've accepted it's a cyber attack and there is absolutely no question with what's happened to the sick public hospital that that's what it is, Megan, there's no rule book, is there? There's no, you know, that happens, you must do this. Unfortunately, there is not. No, each situation will be unique and it has to be worked through in the moment, um, given the best intelligence that we have. Um, and so I agree, it's, it's, it's about um, prioritisation um, and Dottie and the hospital have um, practised and are aware and have a process and then I think um, it's, as she says, connecting through to the crisis um, centre and what I would love to see is that connection from, um, with the authorities who also connect through to another cyber event um, to start thinking through, are there any linkages? Well, indeed, because we don't know at the moment whether they're part of the same attack. Marlene, of course, Glow Power is actually owned 51% by Singapore Power, which means it's essentially owned by the Singapore government. Uh, the rest is listed in both Australia and Singapore. Of course, Singapore is a fairly uh, technically advanced state. They've got a lot of sophisticated cyber experts. Do you give your ultimate owners a call? Absolutely, we uh, will uh, keep them involved firstly uh, to uh, the board 
uh, members uh, that are based in Singapore, but also to the technical experts. So we are uh, relying on them to help us uh, uh, with analyzing this event as quickly as possible and to uh, uh, give us some solutions. Uh, we already have a good idea of what's happening. Uh, we've looked at some of the patterns uh, of access to the system. There's been repeated, uh, uh, um, there've been repeated uh, uh, sort of trials to access the system. You know, password uh, controls have been breached. And uh, we also think that one of our substations that was being refurbished, uh, that possibly uh, there was a, a gap there, vulnerability that has been accessed. So we are investigating all, all aspects so that we can restore power as quickly as possible. Well, Tobias, you're Australia's ambassador for cyber affairs. In essence, that means that you're responsible for liaising with other countries in the region. And in fact, Australia is the current chair of the Asia-Pacific Computer Emergency Response Team. Do you jump on the phone? You've been briefed by Alistair. You know that it's, uh, if not confirmed, it's very much a suspected cyber attack. It's critical infrastructure. It's owned by a friend, which is Singapore. Can you hop on the phone and see if anyone else is having a problem? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's, there's a lot of elements to that, that that are concerning us. Um, the first thing that I wouldn't want to do is get in the way of the operational response domestically to ensure that we get services up and running again. But it's piquing my interest immediately, the fact that this is a Singaporean-owned company, majority-owned company. Um, so we would certainly look, um, we, we signed an MOU with Singapore last year, which allows us a far more free interaction with that government on cybersecurity issues. So certainly I'd be picking up the phone to counterparts in Singapore um, from, if you like, the diplomatic perspective, but also within Alistair's teams, the operational side, they will also be picking up the phone to the computer emergency response teams um, and the National Cyber Agency in Singapore to talk to them, are they seeing similar traffic in Singapore, um, do they have any idea of, of where that's potentially coming from? So it's creating those linkages both diplomatically, policy, and also from the operational standpoint and creating as clear a picture as we can as to where this traffic's emanating from and, and you know, fitting the jigsaw puzzle together of, of exactly beginning to get an understanding of who or what might be responsible. And do regional countries share? Are they happy to, to be an open book when it comes to this sort of thing? Each country is responsible for threat traffic mm. inside its borders. Mm -hmm. so, so computer emergency response teams are, are traditionally very, very good at that. They, they tend to share threat data amongst one another just in order that, that you know, they can plug the gaps as much as possible. Um, certainly from, from a, you know, the geopolitical standpoint, sometimes though we find those relationships not quite as easy as we'd like. Um, we, we, we have been pushing for some time now and we're hoping that this is going to assist a points of contact database across our region so that we know, again, exactly who to call from the diplomatic policy perspective, from the operational perspective. And, and the point of that is that you don't begin to miscalculate or misinterpret what's the traffic that's coming from a particular country because that's where my position becomes very, very nervous, is that you are then entering into a very different set of circumstances to deal with if you're seeing that escalation begin to take place. Well, let's bring this back to the streets of Melbourne, Craig Lapsley. It's well and truly dark now. How much progress have you made and have you tapped into the emergency text alert system? Have you been trying to help people? Is the city still full of people? Well, um, one of the most important things in this is to get ongoing information. We've got to build the story and we owe it to the Victorian community to do that. They will rely heavily on, think about it, if you're on the 23rd storey of a building and the powers of walking the stairs doesn't happen easy. So we'll be out there very quick about the messaging about prioritising who needs to go home. Um, the trip home will be a lot more difficult that afternoon and into the evening and once it gets dark there's no lighting. So you, know, you think about the impacts that are, they're, they're huge. So loss of power We've still got telecommunications. We've well, you have telecommunications, telecommunications to a so point. So let's use it. I was going to ask, how do you uh, communicate? You have this text message service, but of course that risks creating even more congestion yeah. on an already congested network. So, yes, it does. However, if you think about um, websites, the apps, the emergency app that we operate, uh, information into radio, radio is really important because you can sit in your car and listen to it. You know, so we can get that through. Even if I can't... Uh, get on from my electronic radio at home or, or in the office. 
Um, so we've got to get the practical bits, and we've got to go. We've got to go early with this because, but you, again, car, because the phone's running down. But cars are only good if you've got fuel, yes, and of course, fuel can't be pumped at this point. That's right. So we've got all these things that are all of the consequences, or the impacts and consequences, and we'd be mapping this out to say, what are you going to tell people in that first, the first ten minutes, which will be the energy company that's out there first. Mm -hmm. We've then got to come with the community overlay of what are the impacts, what are the consequences, what can you do, and remember, it's got to be a shared responsibility. So we've got to empower people with information. You get some, some other news that's a bit disturbing, news of uh, looting in, of all places, Turak. How concerned are you about uh, security? Because it's not just the CBD. You've got a number of inner suburbs, shopping malls, no power. And that's why police are in charge. So police, police will take the front control because it's about public, public order. It's about um, minimising the opportunity for those opportunists to do exactly that. So we've, we've got to have that. And we need to have that police strength at the front of this. Um, it's, it will be chaos. And what, what brings that is the opportunity for someone to do something they shouldn't be doing. Safety, is, street safety will be a key issue, absolutely key issue, if, if it's dark. You know, that's not the place to be when it's absolutely dark. You, you trip over, you fall. Next minute we've got people that are injured, let alone um, the potential of their, their safety in so many ways. So it, it just keeps going along. Well, Dottie, over at uh, the sick public hospital, you're dealing, obviously, with all your patients and their families, but how is the conversation going regarding paying a ransom? How sure are you of your backup systems? What progress are you making? Great question. So first of all, we, we need to figure out how to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> so that's one thing that we're actually investigating. We're in the, in the conversation also with our um, cyber risk insurance providers as well as law enforcement to sort of coordinate everything. Because you've um, got backup power, but that's it's not right. endless, is it? It's not endless. Uh, we, we do have the generators that, you know, eventually if we can't refuel them, uh, they will run dry. Uh, so we have to make sure that we are, we are really focusing on the things that are most important. Um, so part of our effort is really just communicating with the community about what's happening with, with the information that we currently have available. We don't know everything yet. Uh, we're still doing forensics. We're still trying to figure out the extent of the, the hack. We're still trying to figure out what exactly is happening. But you are investigating buying Bitcoin. Does that mean that you are thinking that you might pay this ransom? Well, it really depends. If we, if we learn that our backup systems have been compromised, we may really have no choice. We have to be able to get the patient records back up on, in line. Um, and of course, with most ransomware attacks, you are given a deadline. So in this case, I, I don't know what our deadline is. We could say seven days or whatever it oh, is. Oh, it's a lot less than that. You've been, you've been given 24 hours maximum. Oh, great. So, so yes, we are investigating all options. We have to keep all the options on the table. The, the, the truth is, as much as paying the, the ransom is a terrible idea, and I think there's a lot of reasons why that's a terrible idea, not the least of which is it makes us a repeat target, uh, we may really not have a choice if our backup systems have been compromised. Well, of course, uh, Megan, you know through the, the circle that's happening now of conversation because you're all being affected, you know that Dottie's pretty new to Melbourne. Do you <laughs> offer some advice? Maybe there are particular circumstances around this city and this state that could help her in her to pay the ransom or not question? Actually, I think that Dottie is um, approaching this in, in a very... Um, methodical way, um, keeping her options open. Having said that, I would be um, having another conversation uh, with Alistair and his team to see whether they were able to assist Dottie to further perhaps understand the nature of the attack and to see whether there was any opportunities perhaps for them to um, intervene to assist her. Well, Alistair, just before you, uh, you take the call from Megan to pass some information on to Dottie, uh, of course, Everyone is aware that the latest security report put out by Telstra said that 47% of companies who actually had a ransomware attack actually paid the ransom. And of those that paid the ransom, 86% got their files back. That's pretty compelling, isn't it? Well, the business model is, is based upon, uh, like any other extortion, pay the money and we won't, uh, we won't keep extorting you. Well, at least this time. We'll come back, as Dottie said because you're now on a suckers list. So the, the, <laughs> the problem is that, uh, that, that uh, paying encourages crime. Uh, that's, I think everyone agrees with that. Uh, the good news is criminals make mistakes. So not all of this uh, uh, ransomware is as sophisticated as, as, uh, as the best. Um, and criminals sometimes leave uh, openings that allow uh, the good guys to unlock it. 
Well, Dottie's got quite a lot with her board and her new CEO to think about. Craig, over at uh, Emergency Management Victoria, the text alert system that you used earlier to let people know what was happening, it issues another message. This one basically urges everyone who is still in the CBD, we don't know how many people that is at this point, urges them to evacuate urgently, citing an unspecified threat. The ABC, which is the emergency broadcaster, picks up this alert, quoting the official system and broadcasts it. Craig, no one in your team sent this message. Hmm. That's a problem. Absolute problem. <laughs> And uh, I'd have to say, um, to participate in a forum like this, there will be a significant learning. I think this will be the learning for us about someone who's taken control of our systems that are there for the good of the safety, and now we're really in a space which is now confirming that we have an event that is not just energy, not just taking control of some, um, some files, that both are significant in their own right. Now we've got someone who is issuing information and I think that takes it to another space. Mm. And because indeed, how do you control. counter that? Because, you know, who's going to believe it? I've had one text yep. message, now I'm getting another. What is happening? Yeah. And, and this is where the authorising environment... So we'd have to go out on all channels um, as the, as the authorising environment, social media in particular, and go very hard. We've never done that before. We've talked about it, but we've mm -hmm. never had to counteract a malicious um, message has been sent. So it is hacking at the highest level. Uh, it is malicious. It's a very malicious act. Uh, and it can take you to a spaces that are extremely dangerous. Alistair, can you help federally? I do note that the uh, Cyber Security Centre actually doesn't have a Twitter account. You must have some other forums, some other ways of helping out. It, um, some of those things will change, Ali, of course. Um, as, as we... <laughs> As Craig said, there are some learnings. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but look, uh, in this case, I mean, the concept of someone targeting uh, public safety officials, as Craig yeah. said, who are there to look after the, the welfare of, of civilians is, is one of those abhorrent acts yeah. that yeah. You, you actually do sometimes see uh, uh, cyber offenders do. So there have been attacks on sort of uh, the safety systems uh, in industries where before you'd seen them, them attacking sort of the, the way business got done. So if you're starting to do that, then you're a particularly malicious person or group. Um, so I don't know whether it's a sp they're spoofed texts because, you know, someone just mm. literally wraps themselves up to look like they come from, from the emergency management folk in Victoria or whether they've actually taken control of their systems. Our people are pretty busy, I suspect, by this stage. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and I think the best course is, is Craig's solution, which is to go out on other channels um, where they can prove and authenticate who they are. So let me put your minds at risk because, uh, Craig, you get a, an early indicator from one of your very trusted advisors that this is indeed malicious, but it's a deliberate act of sabotage by a disgruntled employee. It is, in fact, an inside job. They're trying to get to you when you're down, if you like, to add to your chaos. It's not part of the broader scenario. Sigh of relief. Mm. <laughs> maybe, maybe a sigh of relief. Or, or we've, got somewhere, we've got somewhere to go and understand the controls of our systems. So that, that, that is a sigh of relief in that sense. Then it's about making sure we've got mechanisms to, to bring control back to where it should be. Well, meanwhile, in Canberra, Tobias, you get a call from the top cyber official in Singapore. You made the point earlier that you've recently signed a memorandum of understanding. You know David Coe very well. He gets on the phone and points out to you that, of course, it is a Singapore-owned piece of infrastructure that looks like it's been attacked. So they have had their best IT specialists in looking at the company's control room data. And uh, the early indications that they're getting is that it looks like it's North Korea. Now, you know better than most that over the last five years, North Korea has been blamed for hacking Sony Pictures. Australia was one of the countries that helped to blame North Korea for the WannaCry ransomware attack. And, of course, while North Korea and America appear to be getting on OK, uh, Singapore has actually just cancelled every single work permit hold, held by a North Korean. So it's not out of the question, is it, that North Korea could be behind this? No, as you say, um, we, we attributed the WannaCry incident to North Korea, along with allied partners, and I think that's probably the key part to what happens next. 
um, to play into the scenario and accelerate the timelines. Mm -hmm. If we're beginning to become fairly certain that it's North Korea who's responsible, um, both myself and Alistair will be reaching out to our al allied partners um, to, to see if they are also seeing this traffic. Because if they are and we feel we've got a high degree of certainty, we'll be beginning to pull together our messaging in terms of highlighting the fact that it's North Korea that we feel is behind this incident. Um, at that juncture, I would say that's probably as far as we would get to because, because the incident's still ongoing. We would want to understand the severity of that incident in terms of what it's actually done in terms of harm because then that begins to permeate into our thinking of, well, what are the kind of actions that we might take? Proportionate. Exactly, and, and proportionate. The, like. the other thing I'd say, of course, is you've, you've radically accelerated the timeline yes. here. Um, <laughs> uh, attribution online, and mm. if you're going to come out and name a nation state, is, is no trivial No, and indeed thing. it took eight yeah. months for the yeah. WannaCry yeah. Yeah. attribution. But there is another problem that you've got, and that is that David Coe, the Singapore chief cyber official, says to you that America is well aware of these early reports of North Korea being behind a critical infrastructure attack. And the message for America is don't touch it. Don't do anything that's going to upset the cosy relationship being built between Mr. Trump <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Kim Jong-un. Mm -hmm. What do you do then? Do you just ignore the fact that we might have a state-sponsored player running around one of our major power grids? Certainly not. And, and the kind of political pressure that would be on our positions from our ministers to provide them with the right information and the kinds of options that are there at their disposal would be immense. Um, so that then becomes a political decision Absolutely. of risk and also their appetite to go in an opposite direction to that which our alliance partner is telling us to go. Um, it really does then become into the, you know, into the hands of the politicians. All we, what we would do at that point is just make sure that they had as much accurate and up-to-date information and options as they could possibly have so they can then make the right decision on the basis of that. Well, Marlene, of course, this news has well and truly reached you from your Singapore owners. How do you feel about having the North Koreans inside your operational systems? Well, we're, we're very concerned, but we're also concerned to restore the power as quickly as possible because it's uh, putting out not just the sick hospital, but all other hospitals in central Melbourne. And there are also big data centers which are running utilities and banks and other networks that are also affected. Everyone's on emergency power, has limited fuel. We've got to get the power on. So we're really working hard on doing this. We're starting to inspect our critical substations. And uh, in fact, uh, the simplest solution really is to uh, turn them off and put them onto manual controls where manual controls is possible. And secondly, to use our backups. We've got very good backups of our control systems and settings, and we're starting to restore those backups in an isolated way. But so this is how we're restoring that. Before you restart, how do you make yourself completely confident that flicking that switch is not going to cause another problem? Well, we're not confident uh, at all because of the time frames. It takes a long time. So we are going to take some risk in that. It's quite likely that there'll be some, uh, uh, some hardware problems, some overheating, and you know, where the circuit breakers are affected, the transformers are overheated, but we've just got to deal with it. And uh, the priority is to get the power on. We're going to do it gradually uh, in a systematic way so that we can restore the most important areas of the city first. Over at the sick public hospital, fortunately, your fuel has not run out. Your generators are still operating, but uh, it's been a long night. Have you paid that ransom? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm thinking of whether or not I can claim political asylum now that uh, I know that North Korea is not <laughs> going to get blamed from the U.S. Um, no, so so we, we have been continuing to sort of figure out what our, what our response is going to be. Uh, we have not yet paid the ransom. Um, we have not yet uh, made the determination of whether or not our backup systems have been compromised, and it looks as if the backup systems might be okay, in which case all we really need to do is to clean the computers that are uh, affected and then restore everything from the backup. So we're continuing to make sure that that's true um, before we pay the ransom. So we still have a few hours. We're gonna basically let it go to the very end um, and only pay the ransom if we absolutely must. Um, again, we're continuing to coordinate with law enforcement 
still trying to figure out, you know, what the right response is going to be. But if our backup systems are clean, we're going to just go that route instead. But, but even if you can resolve this or you choose to pay the ransom, this is going to be a long haul for the hospital, isn't it? I mean, you now are publicly known to have suffered a ransomware attack. Uh, how much reputational damage does this do? It's a good question. I mean, I think one of the things that we can feel good about, at least, is that we were in the process of preparing this. I mean, we were having a board meeting. The board understands its role in overseeing this kind of risk. But, but um, almost ready is not quite the that same absolutely as absolutely true. The reputational damage for just having been attacked is maybe not as bad as it would have been five years ago. I think now the reputational damage comes when you are not able to respond quickly or you're not able to communicate with the, the community mm -hmm. appropriately and clearly mm -hmm. and when you can't bounce back quickly. I think those are the things that cause the reputational damage. And so right now that is what we are very much focused on. Again, patient care is the true north for us. We have to make sure that our patients are continuing to receive quality care. You get a, a rather, well, almost groveling apology, really, from Marlene. She's on the phone because she's just learnt that uh, the ransomware attack on the hospital is, in fact, connected to the attack on Glow Power. It appears that the attackers launched the ransomware into the billing system as they were withdrawing from the operating system. Of course, that does match if this was North Korea because they don't have a lot of money, so a bit of a bid to make some money as well as cause some chaos could well be the impetus. Uh, Marlene, what, what do you say to Dottie and how's your insurance looking as a company? This must be opening you up to large numbers of claims. Uh, yes, uh, we will. Uh, we are informing all our customers and of course the sick hospital is one of those. Uh, and we do take responsibility for managing our assets. We do have, uh, in fact, cyber insurance. Uh, and uh, this will uh, be triggered both for our direct uh, damage on our network systems uh, and our equipment, but also third-party uh, liabilities, so people who might have been affected in terms of their health or their, their assets. So it's going to be a very uh, long period that this is going to play out over. But I also wanted to say that, yes, we are prepared, but this... Uh, we've been preparing for such an event for a long time, but this is a scenario that's changing very fast. The networks are you know, highly interconnected systems, and they're getting more interconnected. So as, for example, consumers generate electricity and put it back into the grid, well, they have access also into the grid. So we have potentially millions of people who can access our system, and we don't know who or where they might be if they have some malicious intent. Mm -hmm. So the technology is changing, and the risks are changing all the time. So we're on it, but there's something new happening every day. You need to know what it is you want to protect. Mm -hmm. um, not everything that's run by Glow Power is essential. Mm -hmm. So every company, every government agency needs to know what it is they need to protect. What are their crown jewels? What's important to them as a business? What's important to their customers? And what's important to the people that might want to do them harm? And they might be three very different things. So increasingly complex systems that were once separated, operational technology and IT were very separate, they're not anymore, frankly, uh, and increasingly complex and new technologies. So it's actually understanding uh, what it is you need to protect and ruthlessly focusing on that. It's a risk management exercise and there's no such thing as zero risk, particularly when it comes to cyber. Uh, you connect a device, it's potentially vulnerable. Uh, your job is, and, and I think this is the point Dottie was making, it's not just about preventing an incident. We're past that. Uh, that was Nirvana that disappeared a long time ago. It's about preventing what you can, uh, and hopefully we prevent most. That's the best way uh, to be dealing with matters, not having to deal with them. Uh, detecting when something's gone wrong very quickly uh, and uh, containing the impact of, of whatever that incident is. Uh, it's the same in emergency management, and then getting up and running again. Uh, this is the concept of resilience as opposed to security. And we need to move to a cyber resilience discussion rather than a cyber security discussion. It's not about perimeters, it's not about stopping everything, it's about operating in a real world uh, and accepting the fact that there are risks, but in the most critical areas. Uh, so the good news in Dottie's hospital is, of course, it seems that their, that their critical functions, uh, the machinery, which was attacked in WannaCry, um, when we saw the UK National Health uh, Service uh, 
uh, impacted. Uh, that included some really expensive and important bits of technology. In this case, if it's just, just patient records, <laughs> that's better than uh, machines that are keeping people. Sure. Alive. That, of course, though, is Dottie will tell you over a drink some night when she's managed looking to solve forward to it with the current crisis, yep, just that's right. how yeah. difficult those circumstances can be. But there is uh, some good news now for everyone that's on the good... panel. Marlene, you're hearing from your IT teams that they are now feeling fairly confident they will be able to restart the systems for the morning peak hour, which is rapidly approaching. Uh, Craig, you haven't slept now for something like 24 hours. Uh, you must be pretty pleased to hear that uh, it looks like you're going to have the systems back up and running. Uh, absolutely. But I think um, we need to understand to bring systems back on is also a complex process in some instances. You just can't turn everything back on. We need to work that through and understand what it means. So there's still a need to keep communicating. Are you talking to, to Marlene? Absolutely. Are you having that conversation? Absolutely. And there would be well-established things right from the Premier of the State right through that is well-structured, well-understood, the message is there, uh, the consequences that could be 24 hours or longer, and even if they're not obvious consequences, testing things. Have we had issues in the banking and finance areas? Have we had issues in other spaces that are critical infrastructure that we haven't detected? We need to make sure all those things are back running and the security of the system, the resilience of the systems are actually operating. And Tobias, where did you get to? We talked about attribution. That's obviously a difficult issue, blaming a country like North Korea and can take a lot of time. You need to get other countries involved. But what about using our offensive cyber capability? Malcolm Turnbull has made it very clear that uh, he's directed the Australian Signal Directorate to use our offensive capabilities to disrupt and degrade, deny and deter the four Ds, uh, organised cyber criminals, this would seem the perfect time. So I, I think a really important thing to state is, is to not underestimate the severity of what's just gone on here. This is a nation state that has taken down major infrastructure and basically crippled a major city in Australia for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That becomes an act of state aggression. And one of the big questions to ask is, has there been a loss of life? Or has there been some kind of kinetic impact of that incident itself. If that's the case, if we're looking at loss of life and incident, then, then the severity of the kinds of responses we're thinking about take us into a realm that, that to be frank, we don't really want to get to. But that's where we're heading. Because we, we've, we've said that the entirety of the UN Charter applies in cyberspace, and that's where we're getting to here, which is saying that, that we have the right in international law to be able to respond proportionately to that kind of incident. So when, yes, absolutely, our Prime Minister said that we have an offensive capability, which we maintain, um, and, and use under certain circumstances, um, it's there for a deterrent effect. But actually, in reality, a lot of the responses that we would um, enact for an incident would usually be across the array of the different levers that you have in a government, be they economic, diplomatic, legal channels that you can use. But in, in, in the case of what we've, we're experiencing, we're into the almost extreme end of what a, a, a cyber incident could look like. And if we're talking about a number of deaths, then, then the equations take us, if you like, to the top end of the scale in terms of our thinking of, of what kind of responses we would provide for, for our government to consider. It's probably, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, it's probably important to remember that you don't necessarily fight cyber with cyber. No. Um, so there are a whole range of options that, that, uh, that the Prime Minister and, and uh, his Cabinet colleagues would consider uh, based on advice provided by uh, a whole range of people beyond uh, Toby and I, of course. Uh, and uh, it's all about proportionality and what the consequences are of a proportionate response. And Marlene, uh, key learnings for you too. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, public confidence in the utilities is very important. The industry is going to uh, work together to analyse what happened, to learn from it and again to do better. And of course it's going to take us months to work out the actual damage that's occurred, figure out, you know, fix it, um, and, and also talk to our customers and see where they've been uh, affected. And Dottie, have you written the cheque? <laughs> we, we ended up not paying the ransom. Um, it turned out that our backup systems were, were clean, and so we were able to just simply scrub the computers that been, had been infected and bring everything back online. Um, but there's a lot for us to discuss and to, to really chew on after this event, because we 
think about, you know, had it been other than patient records, had it been machinery, mm -hmm. for example, that had been affected, had it been um, other critical infrastructure systems within the hospital that had been infected, we might not have been quite so lucky. And Alistair, once the lights come back on, can you shut the door on this attack or is this something that will be analysed and poured over and maybe even change some of the ways things are done? Well, it'll be... Um that's possibly where our work begins. Uh, I think the, the cri if the crisis is, is over and uh, Craig and uh, his colleagues here in Victoria and the private sector counterparts at the table have the lights on, the hospital functioning, the work of uh, intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies would, would actually ramp quite dramatically. If the e-census of 2016 is any example, when the while well, that was back up and running again um, after again very carefully making sure you turn it back on, um, uh, if this slightly larger scenario was to play, I suspect we'd have several years of uh, work uh, 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 trawling through what had occurred and very significant learnings. To to your last point, um, you never let these types of matters not teach you better ways of doing business. It's vital for us to learn. Uh, to Toby's point, this is still a really, really young area. Um, uh, we've adopted uh, technologies and using it in ways we've never used them before. Um, the consequences of their misuse uh, can be quite dramatic, as this, um, this uh, hypothetical points out. Uh, and we need to learn what systems are in place. You know, Craig's mentioned some things he's learnt tonight. Um, we, uh, we would learn from this very rapidly. We learnt from WannaCry. I mean, Toby and I uh, went through that process um, last year. Seems longer ago. And we realised that was the first pandemic-style cyber incident we'd been dealing with, you know, spreading across the globe, impacting hospitals in one country, trains in another. Um, and, and, you know, then you mentioned NotPetya in your, your introduction, uh, uh, video. Uh, that shut down ports, shut down a whole range of other critical infrastructure. So we learn from each of these and we learn, did we detect it fast enough? Did we analyse it fast enough? Do we have the right connections with each other fast enough? I can assure your audience that we're better at it than we were last year, but we're not as good as we should be and we're not as good as we will be next year. So at 6.45 the next morning, exactly 15 hours and 10 minutes after this attack, Began. The Glow Power Company brings its substations online one by one. All seems to be going well. Shortly, they're all in operation, and there is a rather large cheer in the control room, also in the boardroom of Glow Power <laughs> as well. The clock ticks over to 6.51. The, stock, the start of the morning peak is almost upon them. And then, out of the corner of his eye, the operator sees the cursor on his computer <laughs> glide across the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where we will end our <laughs> hypothetical tonight. Please join me in thanking our panel very much. <laughs>